All right, brethren, Ephesians, <clears throat> we're going to begin now in Ephesians 5. Let's read verses 1 and 2. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. My subject is, as Christ loved us, as he loved his people. Beholding how Christ loved his people, how he loved us. That's how brethren learn to walk in love toward one another. Beholding how he loved us. We don't learn this by looking to the letter of the law. We learn this by looking to our Redeemer. He's light. All scripture gets its light from Christ. It's all redounds to the glory of his light. And this is where we're going to learn all things, looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. Now, in order to see how Christ loved his people, first thing we're going to have to see is what we were when he first loved us. We were fallen in Adam. We were conceived in sin. God's elect were ungodly. And yet Christ loved us from eternity, knowing the end from the beginning. He loved us. Look over at Romans 5. Romans chapter 5. Right, look here in Romans 5, 6. He loved us when we were ungodly sinners, brethren. Romans 5, 6. When we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man someone even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Look over at 1 John 4.10. 1 John 4.10. Look here, and hold your place in 1 John 4. Mark it, we're going to come back here at the end. But I want you to see here, 1 John 4.10. Herein is love, not that we love God. Now mark that, not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son the propitiation for our sins. When the word of God teaches us to love one another, perhaps we think of our brethren loving us and doing all the right things toward us. We have this ideal, you know, of how the church should be. We have this ideal of, of how, how it'll be to love our brethren but in that ideal, we see, a, we see a perfect church and we see our brethren doing all the right things. Brethren, there's never been a perfect church. Every church in the New Testament had problems. If, if you look at all the, look at the children of Israel as they were walking through the wilderness, brethren, they had problems from the beginning. And all God's elect are called out of sin and united together we're sinners still, and you're going to have problems, and you're going to have troubles. Our sin nature is only evil. Do you believe that? You know, Paul said, when I would do good, this is a sanctified, holy, born again in the new man, a holy man. But he said, but when I do good, evil's present with me. I know, that's a, I know he's saying that as a saint regenerated because... He said, I, what I would do, I will, I have a will to do what God says. No sinner unregenerate has a will to do what the true and living God says. 
You got to be born of God to have a will to do what he said. But he said, but when I would do good, evil's present with me. Always. That's my nature. That's my sin nature, what I got from Adam. And the things that we are to put off, the things he tells us right before this to put off, brethren, that's how we were when Christ came and laid down his life. Look back up there at verse 31, Ephesians 4.31. This is the only thing we were when Christ loved us and laid down his life for his people. Look, verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. That's the only thing we were, the carnal mind. And we were these things toward God. The carnal mind's enmity toward God. And as, as Paul said in, in Titus, he said, we were hate. We hated God, and we hated one another. We, we. That's so. What, what do you think all the problems are going on in the world? You know, we blame this cause and that cause and the other cause, and you know, and when it comes down to it, what it is is just, it's just hate. It's just a sin nature of hateness, hatefulness in the heart. That's how we were toward 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 God, toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet he came forth and laid down his life for us. Then when, when we were born and we were dead in our sins, and the whole time we were dead in our sins, that's all we were toward our Lord. And yet he still loved us and sent the gospel to us and sent the Holy Spirit, regenerated us, and gave us repentance and faith to, to believe him. Well, brethren... It's still what we are in our sin nature. Yes, we're to put those things off, but we sometimes are guilty of those things. As, as a child of God, as one of God's saints, have you been guilty of any of those things? I have. Let's just be honest about what we really are. I have. Why, why is Paul saying put that off? Why is he telling the Ephesian church, brethren, saints, Chosen of God, redeemed by Christ, born of God, all the things he said about them in Ephesians 1. Why is he telling them to put off bitterness and anger and clamor and evil speaking? Because they sometimes were guilty of those things and they needed to put it off. So do we. So what am I to do if one of God's saints is acting that way toward me? You see, the scriptures is not telling me they're not saying, well, your, this is what your brother ought to be doing to you. No, they're saying, when your brother is acting this way toward you, he had put it off. He, maybe he has in the past, and he's been very kind, but all of a sudden one day he's just full of bitterness and clamor and going around slandering. What, how you, what are you to do then? What did Christ do for us? That's what we were. Look here, Ephesians 4.32. Here's what you're to do. Be kind one to another. Tenderhearted. Put yourself in their shoes. Try to, try to think, I, something has really hurt my brother. Something has just really hurt him. Put yourself in their shoes. And look at this. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Why does he tell us to forgive one another? Because there's a whole lot of things about you and me that we're going to have to forgive. <laughs> That's why. So what's the motive of the new heart to forgive? Well, my brother's treat me this way and it's bitter and he's, he's evil speaking. He's going around talking about me. Stirring up clamor and all the... Why am I to forgive him? Why am I to be kind and tender hearted? Now, let me ask you something. Some people will tell you, now, hey, don't be kind and tenderhearted to him while he's doing that. Was Christ kind and tenderhearted to you while you were doing that? Yeah, sure was. Loved you when you were ungodly, when you were a sinner. He loved you to himself. That's how he, that's how he, he drew you. He, in loving kindness have I drawn you, he said. Why does he say that? Or what's the motive of the new heart to forgive? What's the motive of the heart to forgive? Even my brother's doing me that way. 
Look at verse 32. Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. I, I preached on that passage out of the, uh, when the Lord, they brought the woman caught in adultery to the Lord. The Pharisees said, the law says, stoner, what do you say? And our Lord stood between her and the law. He stood between her and those Pharisees. And when he got through, they all went away. And he turned around and he said, does no man condemn you? She said, no man, Lord. And he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And I preached a message and I, and I titled it, The Discipline of Forgiveness. Where do, where do you get that, Clay? What, that's, there's no greater discipline than forgiveness. You know where I get that from? Listen to Psalm 130, verse 3. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. When the Lord has made you to see that if he just marked just a thought you had, you couldn't stand before him. Not to mention just the host, and he's shown you just how sinful you are. And he's drawn you to himself, and he's brought you to pour out your heart to him and confess your utter nothing to him and your sinfulness to him. And he makes you to know in your heart he's forgiven you for Christ's sake. That works reverence in your heart for him. That makes you... Nothing makes you want to serve him and honor him and, and adorn the gospel like knowing he has, for Christ's sake, God's forgiven me all my sin and remembers them no more. And especially when you're in a place where you see your sin and he makes you to know that, that's what makes you reverence him. Remember when he first made you know that? How it just endeared your heart to God? And you, whatever, that's what Paul, you know, he's right to the Ephesians. And he told them they had left their first love. And he, all through this letter in Ephesians, he talks about God's love toward us and about loving one another. What was, they were doing a lot of good works in the, in the letter to the Ephesians. He said they still were doing a lot of good works. But what was this first love they left? That first love you had when you knew all you are is a sinner. And yet God, for Christ's sake, forgiven you all your sin. Remember that? That's the first love. That just when you wasn't so wise and you didn't know all the doctrine and you didn't have it, but you just knew I'm a sinner and he is my savior. He has saved me from everything. And you just was like a little child, that first love. I'm telling you, brethren, nothing... Nothing will help your brother when they're being bitter and they're falling, whatever it is. Nothing will help them like remind them of our Redeemer, remind them what he's done, and letting them know you're there for them. You're not going to, we're not going to come and condemn them. You're trying to help them. You're trying to restore them. You're trying to help them to behold Christ and, and follow him. The whip of the law won't do that. The whip of the law, judgment begets judgment, stirs up wrath, kindness, being tenderhearted, forgiving one another. That's what's going to help one another. Let me show you something now. Luke 6. Go with me to Luke chapter 6. Now I said that we, we do this for one another when, when the, our brother, our sister, not, they're not lovable. They're just not acting lovable. And yet, you try your best to love them. Let me show you here why. Luke 6, 27, the Lord Jesus said, I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh thee. And of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if you love them which love you, what thank have you? 
For sinners also love those that love them. You see that? If we're just loving one another because our brother's being so loving to us, that's good. But, <laughs> but sinners that don't even know the Lord do that. Look here. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what think have you? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But lovely ye your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest. For he's kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. He said, our text says, Love one another as dear children. He said there, if you love like this, even those that aren't lovely, even those that hate you, that would take from you, if you just love them and do for them, not expecting anything from them, he said, you'll be children of the highest. Why? For he's kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Now here's the word. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. You see, all of that's what he's calling being merciful. It's to love your enemies, do good, lend, hope for nothing again. See that? So if we love as Christ loved us, then we're going to love even when we don't receive love in return. Even if we receive hate and evil speaking. Now, secondly, I want you to see it says, love one another as Christ loved us. How else did Christ love He loved his people willingly. He loved his people willingly. Look at verse 2 there, Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us. He did that willingly. He entered covenant to save all those God chose freely by his grace. And he, hadn't, he didn't have to be compelled to enter into that covenant. He didn't have to be promised a reward to enter into that covenant. He did it because he loved his father and he loved those the father gave to him. Loved us freely. And then in the fullness of time, think of how rich the son of God was. He had need of nothing. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, we can't even enter into that. Yet for our sake. He became poor that you through his poverty might be made rich. The Son of God, in the fullness of the time, he came down and was made in the likeness of sinful flesh like unto his brethren. Without sin, walked his earth, made himself under the law to, to do for us what we could not do. <laughs> what, what, what does the scripture say? Uh, if you... If you if you obey the Lord, what are you giving to him? And what I'm saying is he did that for us, not expecting anything in return. We couldn't give him anything in return. He already, <laughs> everything's his. And if we were righteous, we just did what we should have done, and we couldn't do that. But he come down and was made under the law to fulfill his own law for us. He restored that which he took not away. If they, take, if they take your cloak, <laughs> give me another one also. He restored that which he took not away. We took, we took away. Try to take his glory. Try to take, and we try to, we'd have to take him off his throne by our sin and our rebellion. And he came and gave us his cloak. He came and covered us in his righteousness that he worked out for his people. He did that willingly. He said, therefore, doth my father love me because I laid down my life that I might take it again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment I received of my father. When that hour came, our sinless substitute willingly gave himself to bear the sin of his people. And nobody, he wasn't a helpless victim going to that cross. He went there willingly. Somebody said, it wasn't the nails that nailed him to that cross. It was his love for God, his Father, and for his people that nailed him to that cross. He did it willingly. He didn't go as a reluctant victim. He went in perfect faithfulness to bear the sin of his people and bear the curse for his people. 
bear the, he took all the sin of his people and it bore the fierce, just wrath of God in place of his people. Listen, that gives some new meaning now. That gives all meaning to Galatians 6 2. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Will I set a limit to my brother's offenses? We will, won't we? Sadly, we will. We'll set a limit. We set a limit to God's grace. God's grace has no limit. God's forgiveness has no limit. Christ, when Peter said, how often should I forgive my brother? Till seven times? The Lord said, I say not till seven times, till 70 times seven. That means without limit. He said, he said, I'm God and I change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. He never ceases loving his people. All we like sheep have gone astray and we've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He took all the iniquity, all the vilest sin of his people and laid it on Christ and Christ willingly went to that cross, the spotless Lamb of God, to bear what we are. To declare God just, to declare his righteousness and he bore that just fury of God's wrath that, that we earned. He didn't earn it. We earned it. And he took our place and bore that for us. Doesn't that give some... That's all the meaning to bear ye one another's burdens. We're never going to bear one another's sin like he did ours. We're never going to bear one another's burdens like he did ours. But that's the love of... The law that we're under is the law of Christ. It's the law of faith and love. Faith constrained by love, motivated by love. When a brother is condemned by men, and men are condemning him, if you really, you know, we have this thought, we've got to really show our, our stand for the Lord, and boy, we'll just chime in there right with them and start condemning somebody. You really want to show how much you believe God and trust the Lord Jesus? You stand between the brother and the condemner. You know something about that. You stand between him and the accuser. You say with Paul what he said of Onesipus to Philemon, whatever he owes you, put that on my account. When Christ bore the burden of the fierce fury of God's just wrath, he did that for me. He did that for all his people. You want to really show how you trust him and really show and love as Christ loved you? Stand between, like he stood between the Pharisees and that woman. But she was guilty. She was caught in the act. That's how Christ loved us. Wasn't you guilty caught in the act? Every one of us, if he should mark iniquity, we couldn't stand. And yet he stood between us and that fierce fury of holy justice and satisfied that justice on behalf of his people. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Oh, he surrendered himself, brethren. He went to that cross and he bore that curse that he might deliver his people from it. He couldn't give more than he gave. That's another way he loved us. He didn't just give a little. He gave everything he had to give. He couldn't have given more than he gave. And less would not have redeemed us. Less would not have satisfied justice. He gave all he had and nothing less would have satisfied. The God-man. His faithfulness to God's everlasting covenant was his constraint. His love for the Father was his constraint. His love for his people was his constraint. That was his motivation. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. It wasn't a pleasant. How did he love us? He bore some suffering for us. Scripture tells us to be long suffering. That, that doesn't mean just put up with it a long time. That means suffer as you put up with it a long time. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened out his mouth. He could have opened his mouth and justified himself and condemned every one of us. And that's why he didn't open his mouth. He would not condemn his bride. He kept his mouth shut and he bore it. 
He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his ears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And he was taken from prison and from judgment. Oh, this is not right. It's just a principle. It's not right. And they're not doing what's right. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Well, do you think anything men did in their kangaroo court was just? Nothing about it was just. They came bringing, looking for false witnesses. Who shall declare his general? He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. As Christ loved us. Love one another as Christ loved us. You know, when you behold the perfect love of the Lord Jesus Christ, dare any of us, dare any of us boast of our love for our brethren now listen to what I'm about to say. How do we do that? How do we most boast about our love for our brethren? By being critical of how somebody else loves. When you're critical of how somebody else loves, you might as well be standing up saying, I love like I ought to be loving. That's what the Pharisee did in the Lord's parable. That's what he was doing. He was boasting that he did how being critical of that publican. That kind of bitterness, brethren, and that's all that is, is bitterness. It's, it's evil speaking. That lands you in legal bondage. It doesn't do you any good. It puts us in legal bondage to, to be critical of others. We end up in bondage and bitterness. That's not the spirit of the Lord, James said. That's sensual spirit. It's devilish. That's our old nature. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Be not entangled again with that yoke of bondage. Brethren, look at Galatians 6. I just want to read this to you because I want, I want you to see it. Just a couple pages back. Galatians 6, <clears throat> in verse uh, 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, and that means sin. I mean, that's, that's, he's fallen. He just fell. The brother has fallen. You which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Spirit of meekness now. Meekness is trust in the Lord, number one. You know, Moses called the meekest man on earth. Why? Because every time he was opposed, every time trouble came, every time they were murmuring against him, what did Moses do? He hid his face and cast it all on the Lord. Every time. Except for that time he got mad and smoked a rock twice. So in the spirit of meekness, trust in the Lord. Consider thyself. Consider thyself lest you also be tempted. In other words, watch your own self because you're not careful. You'll be, you'll be right back with the same, falling in the same sin. Or worse, self-righteousness. Bear ye one another's burden, so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. See what the Lord says there in his word that we are. <laughs> we're nothing. And when we think we're something, we're deceiving ourselves. Now lastly, is Christ one offering, brethren? Now first we saw, what, remember what we are. We were the ungodly when Christ loved us. And secondly, Christ loved us willingly. That's how he loved us. So love one another willingly. He loved us completely. He gave himself entirely. And now, lastly, remember this. To love is Christ's love. We need to remember this. It is Christ's one offering. It's his one sacrifice in place of his, of his people that made his people righteous before God. Now read it again. Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us. That's substitution right there. Gave himself for us. That's for his elect. But look, he gave himself an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Christ, when he walked this earth, he said the fulfillment of the law is love. Christ Jesus is where we see that love. He loved God his Father in such perfection. He loved his brethren in such perfection. And here's how he loved us. He gave himself 
to be forsaken of God. He was left alone of, his, of those he was dying for. But he did it to satisfy justice for us. He, he became the least, the absolute least, bearing, made a curse for us to declare God just and declare God the justifier and save his people, to glorify his Father and save his people. Now, that's the perfect love that is the fulfillment of the law. You and me will never love like that. Not this side of glory. Our love's going to have some sin mixed with it. But that's the perfect love that made us righteous, brethren. He's the one foreshadowed in the burnt offering. The scripture says, Exodus 29, 18, where Paul's getting this from, he said, Thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It's a burnt offering unto the Lord. It's a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Our Lord Jesus Christ took the fire of God's wrath, and whereas in the offering the fire came down and consumed the sacrifice, our Lord consumed the fire and put it out for his people. There's therefore now no condemnation. And with that perfect love toward God and that perfect love toward his people was a sweet-smelling savor unto God. And he's accepted that sacrifice, and he's pleased with that sacrifice, and he's satisfied with that sacrifice. And that's the only offering and sacrifice whereby God's elect have Honored the law in every jot and tittle in perfection. And, and I'm trying to say it's not just obeying it in the letter. And the, it is, it's that love of, of what Christ did at Calvary's cross. That's the fulfillment of the law. That's why you and me can never make our boast that we have done it ourselves. We can't make our boast we've loved in any way as so as to fulfill the law. When Christ said... Greater love hath no man than this to man lay down his life for his friend. That's Christ preeminently. He's the one that did that. And he did it perfectly. And that's the sweet smell and savor that God's pleased with. Now let's end by looking back over at 1 John 4. 1 John 4. That sweet smell and savor to God means... God, Christ justified his people. He entered into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us and therefore God's going to send the gospel to each one for whom he died. He's going to give them life and faith and repentance just like he did to you sitting here today. God's pleased with that sacrifice that Christ made. The one offering, the one sacrifice. So let's end by looking at 1 John 4 now. When we read verse 10, I want to read it again. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son, the propitiation for our sin, the sin expiating sacrifice that made us accept it. Look here. Beloved, if God so, and that word so means after this manner. When, when you read John 3.16, really that word so, for God so loved the world, that word so means after this manner. And Christ was telling Nicodemus how God loved his people. He said, you must be born again. That's how God loves his people. He sends the Spirit and gives you a birth, new birth. He said, we speak that, we do know. God loves through the gospel. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's how God loves. He loves through Christ Jesus the Lord who laid down his life for his people. For God, after this manner, loved the world. How does he love? Whosoever believeth on him. He saves through faith. That's in his son. His son does the saving. And right here it means after this manner. Beloved, if God after this manner loved us, we ought also to love one another after this manner. That's just what it means. How did he do it? Not that we love God, <laughs> but that he loved us and he sent his son. That's number one. He loved us when we didn't love him. So number one, let us love even when we're not loved in return. Number two, God loved us by giving the best he could give. He gave his only begotten son. Let me tell you how you're going to show the greatest love you can give. Show somebody is give them the best thing you have to give. And you know what that is? It's the gospel of God's only begotten son. You, you, when your brothers are fallen or, or they need strength or they're down or, or they're treating you ugly, whatever it is, don't go and try to just speak it back. Just remind me what the Lord's done for us. 
remind them what the Lord's done for us. How he loved us when we didn't love him. That's how you restore your brethren. What are we restoring? It's like restocking the shelves. You restore them with the gospel of Christ. Give God gave the best he could give. He gave his only begotten son. That's the best you got to give too. I guarantee it. Love that way. And let us remind one another continually of Christ. And then God the Father loved his people. Here's how he loved his people. Now get this. It's what he's saying there. He trusted us to his son. That's how he loved us. He trusted his son from eternity and sent him forth. I trust you, son. Go save him. Well, let me tell you how you're going to have to love your brother. You're going to have to trust Christ. Trust them to Christ. That's how you love them. What do you mean by that, preacher? Well, the only way we can truly love is through faith in his son. That's the only way we can. What's, what the is not of faith is sin. The only way you can love is trusting him. Now listen, when, Paul, when the Lord told Peter, Peter, forgive without limit, how are you going to do that without trusting that Christ has already put away the sin of your brother and God remembers this sin no more? You, the only way you can really forgive is through faith in the Lord Jesus. That's the only way you can. If you don't believe Christ, you can't forgive your brother. Why? Because I'm going to have to believe that, that however my brother's acting, I'm going to have to trust. I know he's, I've seen, seen that in myself, in my sin nature. But I know Christ has died for him. I know he believes the Lord. I'm going to trust the Lord and I'll forgive him. Because God doesn't remember sin anymore. I'm not going to remember it either. And then the only way we can be forbearing and long-suffering and forgiven is trust in Christ is the master who's able to make him stand. That's the only way. You, you can't make another brother stand. You couldn't give him faith. You can't grant him repentance. You can't change another person's heart. All you can do is pray for him and trust him to the master, but he's the master able to make his servant stand, and he will. And you've got to believe God to do that. You've got to believe Christ to do that to wait on the Lord and trust the Lord. We can't love without faith in Christ. God the Father trusted us to his son. You're going to have to trust your brethren to, your, to his son. <laughs> That's the only way you can love. So you go to Christ and you pray for one another. You go to him and you beg, beg him, Lord, please protect them. Hedge them about. Save them. I really think sometimes we don't think that's doing anything. That's doing more I pray you pray, pray for me because that's doing more for me than you could do for me in any other regard. Christ's going to meet the, he's met our need at Calvary's cross. He's going to meet our need as we, to make us walk by faith. You just, you can bank on that. Christ loved us by bearing our sin, by standing between us and the law, by covering our sin so that God remembers it no more. So love one another by bearing one another's sin, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is Proverbs 10, 12? Hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all sins. That's what, that's what God who is love, that's what he did for us, covered all our sins in the blood of Christ. Remember that woman with the alabaster box of ointment? Christ said, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Therefore, she loved much. <laughs> and he said, For to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. I'm going to tell you something. When you know something about how great our sins are, and yet how merciful God's been to us, how gracious and how much he's forgiven us our sins through the blood and righteousness of Christ. That's what will make you love. And I tell you, we, we lose sight of how sinful we are. The Lord will let you fall on your face. He'll let you need mercy. He'll let you need forgiveness. And then he'll show, shower you with it. And I'm telling you, like I said, son, when you come fresh out of that trial, that's, that's where... <laughs> You want to just be compassionate. You want to be merciful. You just, whatever I do to help, I want to help. I want you to see Christ. I want you to know him. I'll, I want to forgive you. And then we'll go a little while and, and we'll forget. And he'll have to remind us. But he's going to keep us knowing. You know what we're doing in all this? We're laying down our life for our brethren. 
in a little small way, not even anything like what Christ did, but in a little way. But remember this now. Paul said in Galatians 6, let every man prove his own work. Then, you, then you'll have rejoicing in yourself alone, not in another. What he's saying is, you mind your business. You mind your business. You mind your business. You mind your business. You prove your own work between you and, and you'll have rejoicing between you and the Lord alone. And that's opposed to the Pharisees who try to make a fair show in the flesh and so they constrain you too and you put anything in the place of circumcision. They just want to constrain you. Why? That they may glory in what they made you do. God saved us out of that religion. I don't want to take you back in it. So you prove your work. Because Scripture doesn't tell me how you're to be treating me. It tells me how I'm to treat you. It doesn't tell you how I'm to treat you. It tells you how you're to treat me. In other words, let us each prove our own work. You get what I'm saying? We're not to be critical and going around, well, I don't think they're doing If we just all focus on making sure we're serving one another like the Lord teaches me personally to serve you, then the Lord will take care of me. I can trust the Lord will take care of you. You're his. And we'll just get along so so well because we're all looking to Christ and trusting Him. And and I go to 2 Corinthians 5.14. I, I was going to preach 30 minutes. I had gone nine minutes over. All right, I'm almost, I'm done. One scripture left. 1 Corinthians 5.14. I think this goes right along with uh, Paul said they, they constrain you to be circumcised to make glory in your flesh. He said, God forbid that I glory saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's, look here now. Here's our motivation. It's not the constraint of men. I'm not going to come around trying to constrain you to do one thing, brethren. I want your faith to stand in the power and wisdom of God, not because I forced you into doing something. So I preach Christ to you, I pray for you, and I wait on him to give you the grace to do it. And it's his love for us that is our motivation. Circumcision avails nothing uncircumcision. It's faith which worketh by love. Be a man a new creation. But look at this. When, when that happens, verse 14, the love of Christ constraineth us, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge. If one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but to him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. They're so important, brethren. He was talking to people judging after the appearance. Look, you can act a lot of times like you don't even know the Lord. I can act like I don't even know the Lord. But we're not judging after the flesh anymore. I've heard you speak of the Lord. I've heard the spirit you have toward Him. I trust you believe Him. And when you fall, you stumble, I'm just going to try to remember... I, there's a new man in there in that in that believer there's a new man that loves the Lord knows the Lord I need to strengthen him and the only way I can help help do that is preach this gospel this bread from heaven pray to the Lord to do it so we don't know each other after flesh anymore we, our religion is spiritual we're not trying to put on a show brethren I know what you are you know what I am so love one another Paul said, let us not be weary in well-doing. In due season we'll reap if we faint not. We have therefore opportunity. Let us do good to all, especially to them who are the household of faith. Do it with the constraint of Christ's love, what he's done for us, as Christ has loved you. So love one another. Amen.